All right, all right, all right, all right. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. Welcome to another episode of VOX World. We are coming thick and fast right now. Uh, we've got some people tuning in on YouTube. Uh, Ad White, yeah. I'm hoping I pronounced your name right. Apologies if I don't. Welcome, Rohit, welcome. Um, we are going to get moving right about now. We have a tremendous guest joining us today to discuss a topic that is immensely, immensely uh, passionate part of, of what we do at VUX World in all things speech technology and voice technology related and the crucial part of that voice technology stack is the automatic speech recognition not just for voice assistance but automatic speech recognition is being used in all kinds of different places to help businesses solve some real challenges and to help provide value to users and so we're going to get into that today a little bit about speech recognition how you can utilize it what mistakes companies are often making when implementing it how you can avoid that how you can select the appropriate speech recognition vendor and a whole bunch of other things as well that you should, you should consider uh, when embarking on any voice-based project. Our guest today is Deepgram CEO, Scott Stevenson. Scott, welcome to VUX World. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. Absolute pleasure. I was just sitting there. We've been connected on LinkedIn for so long, and this is the first time that we're actually doing this. It's a long time coming, but I appreciate you joining us. Yeah, absolutely. Glad to be doing it. Nice one. What's that t-shirt there? Listen to the... Well, you can fill in the blank, you know, listen to the, <laughs> to the listen valuable to the audio, listen to, beep. yeah. <laughs> listen to the beep audio. I like yeah. it. I'm a little bit like a Where's Wally sort of character today. Yeah. I, I keep feeling as though I should be like yeah. <laughs> hopping up out of a, I should have a, a, a busy, busy background behind me and people can. Uh, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> point me out uh but welcome welcome everyone tuning in if you do have any questions as we progress through the course of this conversation then please do stick them in the comments and we will do our best to answer them or scott will do his best to answer them should i say uh, i am merely here as a facilitator and a uh, willing observer into your brain scott and into your knowledge which i'm looking forward to uh so thanks for joining us so let's get started with some brief intros you have a uh, rather interesting and peculiar background traditionally in terms of where you began your your journey so you want to tell us a little bit about your your prior experience and how you got to found deep gram and then we'll move into a little bit about deep gram what it is and what it does sure yeah um so previous to deep gram i was a particle physicist so i built deep underground dark matter detectors um both in china and in the us uh but think like two miles underground you know a mile or two underground um in tunnels dug by tunnel boring machines or in mines like uh the, the one in the us was a was a gold mine that's over 100 years old um but it's a great these places are great places to do uh dark matter experiments uh, because you have a giant shield on top of you. That shield is the crust of the earth um, and it's blocking out cosmic radiation. And uh, if you don't know, um, everything around you is radioactive. What you eat is radioactive. You're radioactive. You know, it's, it's sleeping next to your uh, partner uh, throughout your life. Uh, they're radioactive in a, a non-trivial amount. Uh, of course, humans have, you know, evolved to be able to deal with the, with a certain level of radioactivity and, and we're, for the most part, totally fine. Um, and by the way, that, that radioactivity is totally natural. It's not from, like, nuclear activity or anything like that uh, for nuclear energy or weapons. It's just literally there's cosmic radiation that rains down on the Earth and it creates a whole bunch of stuff. Um, also, just the atoms and everything that the soil is made out of has a lot of thorium and other stuff in it, and it's radioactive. Um, but, but nevertheless, um, that we're in the, in that experiment, we are trying to run away from that radioactivity and find the quietest place in the universe, or build the quietest place in the universe. And so, the first thing you do is you go deep underground, and then you place uh, your experiment there with a whole bunch of shields. It's like an onion; it has many layers. Um, and you you have kind of a dirty shield on the outside, which is the earth and then a less dirty shield less dirty less dirty until you get to a really pristine interior and that interior um is the quietest place in the universe there isn't much going on in there and then if something does happen inside 
uh, then you know that it's interesting. And um, that's what we were doing is capturing interactions inside. And uh, the interactions were just little puffs of light, basically, just, you know, splashes of photons. And we had really sensitive uh, sensors that could pick those up. And those sensors uh, were analog, though. They were not digital. Uh, they, they, they were waveforms. They, were, they, they looked a lot like uh, audio, actually. And so that, that's kind of how the crossover here happened was we got really good at analyzing hundreds of signals in real time um, to figure out if there was anything interesting going on inside this detector. Um, but hey, if if you have hundreds of conversations going on, you might want to know what's interesting inside them as well. And and what we were doing in the physics world was using end-to-end -end deep learning and hardware acceleration in order to do this, in order to make it all work. And uh, it it turned out, you know, it turned out really well. We published a paper on it. Um, but also that technology we realized could be used in other areas. And uh, six years ago, we started DeepGram and, and made the big bet that you could take end-to-end um, -end deep learning, hardware accelerate it, and then uh, launch it to the world uh, world as an API um, and put it in the hands of developers so that they can build voice products and voice companies uh, around it. And uh, that's a, that's what we do now. Interesting. So, so you ended up through... It's a random spot to begin. Being a particle physicist is a very... Uh, <laughs> It's a very deeply technical, I suppose it helps, I suppose, being a very deeply technical kind of raw uh, kind of skill set, understanding tremendous amounts of detail because mm -hmm. you can't have a very, if you're measuring reactors underground mm -hmm. and measuring, trying to pick up the slightest signal and analyzing tremendous amounts of data, you've obviously got a brain for that kind of stuff, taking a, a whole bunch of detail, extracting insights and knowledge from it. Where did, how did that lead to kind of specifically speech recognition? Because monitoring bits of light coming out yeah. of particles clashing, you yeah. know, some people might not necessarily draw a direct correlation between yeah. speech recognition. So where did the, the kind of journey to, to specifically the speech recognition come from? Mm -hmm. What was your interest in speech recognition? Yeah, there's a yeah, there's there's a lot of facets uh, to that. I mean, just in particular, I I uh, love love playing music. Have uh, you know, I understand audio engineering and you know a dynamic compression and all of that thing, and have always had an interest in audio. Um, uh, it, but I think also just kind of from the from the signal perspective too. So. Uh, there are different types of data in the world. There's images, there's text, and then there's uh, like time sequence data. And uh, audio is a form of that. Music is a form of that. Um, the signals that we were analyzing in these experiments were a form of that. They were they were just a waveform that got sampled every 10 nanoseconds, and you read the value, uh, the voltage value on a specific center, hundreds of them, but nevertheless. And, but you would see it, it, you know, it has shape to it. it you could actually play it as if it were sound. Um, if you slowed it down. Um, and so a lot of the algorithms that we were working on, um, these different pulse finding algorithms and shape finding algorithms, um, we we tuned them by hand at first, but then we thought, oh man, this doesn't, it works It works all right, but it doesn't work as well as you would want. And we, we just had a, um, you know, a thought that, hey, we as humans can look at this and we can tell the difference. Um, we're able to learn and look at the signal and be like, hmm, it looks like it's this type of event versus that type of event. So we're, we're always trying to figure out signal versus background. Is it dark matter or is it something else, basically? And you could look at the events and, and, and really you could see with your own eyes as a smart human. And it's like, why can't we make algorithms that are just as good or better than us at looking at it and now be able to go do that at scale? And um, that's the real thought that went into it. And the only r way to do that with any efficacy is to use machine learning. And so we went down the path of, learning and building our own machine learning and putting it in place and running it at scale on those types of signals. And so, you know, if I, if I back up from it all um, and I look at like what we do day to day in DeepGram today and what we were doing day to day in physics uh, back then, it's actually really, really similar. Um, the under, the, the uh, one of my uh, colleagues uh, put it, put it a great way. Um, at least if, if you're a physicist, it, it makes tons of sense. It, they say the world is translationally in, variant, meaning like many problems are actually the same kind of problem. They're just disguised in a bunch of different dressing. And um, this this problem that we were solving in physics is actually very, very similar to the audio problem of trying to understand what people are saying. And 
um, we, we just recognized that and recognized that the world uh, was trying to solve that problem uh, one way. Like if you went out to Nuance, Google, Microsoft, you know, uh, Amazon, um, uh, it, it, IBM Watson, those, those type um, of companies, uh, they were trying to solve it not using end-to-end -end deep learning. They were trying to solve it by developing an acoustic model which tries to understand the phonemes that people spoke and then feed that into a pronunciation model, which takes those phonemes and tries to figure out what words possibly they could have been saying. And then there's another step which goes into a language model that says, well, which words make sense to happen in a sequence, basically. And that's not our approach. Our, our approach is very different than that. We say, well, actually there's just one model and that model takes an audio and it puts out words, but you give it a goal. And that goal is to get the words correct. And so if you put it into a training scheme uh, where you reward it appropriately, um, our you know our hope, our idea here is that it, the model will actually learn faster, better, deeper, uh, et cetera, as long as you have enough data and you have enough compute and you have enough uh, or the right algorithms in order for it to happen. And so um, that's the journey of DeepGram over the last six years has been um, getting enough compute, enough data and the correct algorithms in place and the right team around it uh, to build that, that, uh, that kind of new way to do speech recognition, which is a just purely learn by example approach rather than um, speech engineers like hand tuning things. Hmm. So the way that you described Amazon and the other approaches with a lot of different kind of like almost sub processes that happen. Yeah. So how is it that you're able to then just take audio and turn it into, into text without that because every time we've spoke to most people we've had i think we had Catherine breslin on the show and she was talking mm -hmm. about speech recognition and not mm -hmm. necessarily in the in the detail in terms of like what it mm -hmm. is and how it works but in terms of some of this pipeline you know she was at amazon for a while familiar with yeah. their kind of pipeline um so that's the only real way that i've come across it being done what is it kind of what is it that you are able to do that makes it either different or better than that kind of process. How, how is it that you just take audio and it ends up being words? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think, um, well, one thing, you know, the w one way to tackle that problem is to just first start, you know, and say like, that is our goal. Our goal is to have that happen. Like, uh, and it's either that or a bust. And uh, the reason that we would have that goal is that um, we, we believe that that's the right way to solve the problem or that's the way that would actually win and um what wh what we mean by that is on in the long term you know maybe not today maybe maybe not well when we were starting it six years ago maybe not then maybe not two years in but you know eventually this is the way that it, it that will it will end up working and the reason that we have that intuition is that this is how humans learn you know that we learn by example we 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 can learn from a situational cues we can do that type of thing and so um, why wouldn't a machine be able to do it as long as you have enough compute power and expressive enough algorithms? And so we just had made that assessment around like, do we think end-to-end um, -end deep learning is expressive enough? And do we think there's enough data around and, and, uh, and talented uh, people that can put it all together? And, um, you know, the, our bet early on was that that answer was yes. If you were if you were to ask uh, speech experts at the time, they would have said no, like uh, language is too complicated. How are you going to deal with different dialects? How are you going to deal with different noise profiles? How are you going to deal with all the different languages and different domains in those languages, et cetera? And we're thinking, well, if your system is expressive enough and you have enough data, it, that will solve the problem, just like it does for a human. A human, it, it you know, we have a very uh, expressive algorithm, you know, hardwired into our brain. Um, we can be dumped in situations and maybe at first be very confused about by it, but we'll start to pick up on things and we'll and we'll get better over time. And you know, given enough time, you can do really well at, at it. And so, anyway, that was the intuition. Um, and I think it really helped that we were not from a speech background. I. I don't have, you know, my, my PhD was not in uh, speech, it was in uh, physics, it was in solving hard problems with messy data. Um, and we just looked at speech that same way. And we didn't look at it with the preconceived notions that you had to have an acoustic model, a pronunciation model, and a language model, um, which I think weighed down a lot of researchers for a while because they wanted to fit it into that framework. And um, yeah, it, it was better to just, to, to just 
you know, burn it all down and start a, a, again anew, given new constraints, new new processors like GPUs, um, using only end-to-end -end deep deep learning techniques and chasing after that goal. Um, and you know, within a couple of years of starting, uh, we knew that it was going to work, and now it's just a question of distributing it to the world um, and uh, continuing uh, continuing to expand to different languages and and that type of thing. Hmm. Interesting. So you mentioned there that you didn't have a speech background, um, but you're using words like neural networks and you're using these kind of like AI terms. Um, so where did you acquire that understanding from? Were you using neural networks and all of that stuff in your particle physicist days? Yes. Was it some, you were using that kind of stuff already. Yeah. And um, I, I think, uh, uh, if there are any physicists in the crowd, their their ego may be stroked here a little bit, but but nevertheless, like ph the physicists, I think they they think of themselves as being able to understand the world from first principles. Um, they may not be the best at that particular you know area, so I don't think I'm a, a world class computer scientist, like not at all. Uh, I don't even I don't think I'm a world class physicist. I don't think I'm a world class mathematician or chemist or any of those things. But many physicists think of themselves as uh, being world class and being able to put all of that together and achieve some goal. So it's more like a problem solving mindset while being able to go deep from a first principles perspective on what really matters. Um, and uh, so when you look at like the speech problem, uh, you could you could think like, well, you have to have an acoustic model, a pronunciation model, a language model, and it takes up this much memory and it does this. And, and we've all seen before that acoustic models have problems with this type of noise and that type of noise. And we just start you know, from the beginner's mind and say like, what if you don't know any of that? Um, how does a human learn? And they learn by example. And you you show you basically show humans uh, pairs of here's here's the audio and here's the text that goes along with it. Um, do we think that there's enough expressiveness in between with current technology, meaning like GPUs or uh, application specific uh, processors or whatever it is to like attack that problem? And we just surveyed what was available at the time, the tools that were available at the time. And it's like, I think so. I mean, there's enough teraflops out there to do uh, what we think you could do. Um, the, the real trick was, could you, uh, we were very confident that you'd be able to do it with a small enough vocabulary. Um, we didn't know if you'd be able to go to a very large vocabulary. And it's been it's been shown now, or at least we've shown, that you can go to a very large vocabulary as well. But that was one of the biggest unknowns early on is maybe you make a really great speech recognition system that is end to end, but it could only work on like a thousand words or something like that. And if you go if you go far beyond that, then it can't it can't deal with it. Uh, maybe. Um, but that's not the case. Um, you, you know, you can go to hundreds of thousands of words, millions of words, et cetera. And so anyway, I think it's just that beginner's mindset that really helped us break out of it, you know, and, and I think this is something that's talked about a lot in startups as well, where you just start on something and then um, you're, you may not be the, uh, uh, the expert when you first start, you might not be an expert a couple of years in, but, uh, but pretty soon you will definitely be an expert on your market. You'll be an expert on how they react to different products um, uh, being put out into the world. But, but over time, you're also going to accrue those skills, uh, like the technical skills as well. Um, but for us in particular, uh, we were we were building um, machine learning previous to speech uh, as well in in a very similar way using using uh, fully connected layers, CNNs, RNNs, etc., in order to build systems that operated on things that looked like audio waveforms. Uh, you know, we were, we were we were building those previous uh, to this. But now it was just, hey, can you go to really large uh, vocabulary and have it expressive and be able to transfer, learn into different languages and that type of thing? And um, it's not easy, but the answer is yes, you can. Hmm. Interesting. So we we kind of got right into the meat of it all there, which is which is which yeah, is fantastic. Uh, and I definitely want to keep going down that that kind of thread because there's a number of questions I've got following that. But um, for, let's let's kind of bring it up a level and and, and discuss. So obviously, Deep Gram is a speech recognition company. For mm -hmm. those people who have not come across speech, uh, Deep Gram before, I'm, I know that our our listeners and audience are familiar with speech recognition. But mm -hmm. do you want to kind of shed a bit of light on the kind of use cases that Deep Gram kind of support and, and how Deep Gram's API and speech recognition capability is being used at the moment out there in the real world? 
Sure. Yeah. So we, um, yeah. So we we are a speech API uh, for developers. So you can you can sign up to use DeepGram to transcribe audio in real time. Uh, you can do it across ab about a dozen different languages right now. Uh, you can do it in re uh, in in real time, or you could do it in a pre recorded mode. So you know maybe. Uh, you, in principle, if you hooked it all up, you could have you know DeepGram transcribing this as, as we're having the conversation now, or afterward, when when the conversation is over, you could submit it, submit the pre-recorded file to DeepGram and have it transcribe uh, that way as well. Um, the output of the transcription is words, like as you would expect. Um, punctuation, that type of thing, but also um, timings and confidences. So it can tell you when the words happen. It could tell you with what confidence the, the model thinks that word was actually spoken, uh, that type of thing. Um, and then we offer other services like uh, speaker diarization. So in particular, like this recording, um, if it were recorded only to one single channel, um, which is fairly typical, uh, then you wouldn't have an obvious way to tell who was saying what. Um, it, you would have all these words, but you wouldn't know who was saying it. Um, speaker diarization um, is, is what helps solve that problem. It breaks uh, the audio up into uh, the different speakers and labels them, hey, this is one speaker, this is another speaker, et cetera. So you can see that there's a conversation going on back and forth. Um, we also do things like uh, automatic language detection. So if you're a a uh, large platform, um, like a you know, like a meeting platform. Um, you have all sorts of meetings happening in different languages and things like that. Um, it could be someone in the U.S., but they're calling somebody else uh, up in the U.S. and speaking Chinese to them. That's a very that's a very common thing. Um, and uh, what do you do about that? Uh, do you make them select the language that they can then transcribe? You know, like it doesn't. It, what what kind of user experience is that? That's not good. Why don't you have something that automatically detects which language they're speaking and then transcribe it actually in that language and uh, that type of thing. So anyway, we, we build the uh, products that um, that allow companies uh, to build uh, new voice products on top of them or build entire companies based on it. And so to give you an idea of the, the products uh, that we're deployed to now, um, it can be like a real-time agent assist for a call center. So two humans having a conversation, um, but maybe the agent isn't all that well trained yet. Uh, and they have like an exoskeleton, a something that's helping them out that's listening to the conversation and saying, hey, this person's asking about this particular phone with this particular problem. You know, it looks like the steps that they should take are X, Y, and Z, um, say that to them, you know, and then the human, you know, the, the agent will say that type of thing. So it's a, it's, so it's a real time agent assist. Um, we have uh, companies that use uh, DeepGram for uh, other uh, call center things as well, like um, uh, for compliance to figure out, you know, are, are people saying like, hey, do I have your permission to create this account, that type of thing, or uh, or for, for training, you know, to look to look up, um, you know, did you cover this thing you're supposed to cover, that type of thing. Um, but uh, th that would be in the speech analytics uh, regime. But there, there's also a lot of other use cases. So um, like food ordering um, is, is common. Um, understanding what buyers in physical retail stores are saying about products that they're looking at. And so people will put uh, uh, recording uh, devices on the showroom floor and then figure out what people are saying about different items and that type of thing. Um, or um, like NASA uses DeepGram for space to ground communication for the International uh, Space Station. Um, they have a lot of jargon, a lot of messy audio. It's, it's a very tough uh, thing to transcribe and they have a whole backlog of it uh, as well because they record everything on that side. Um, and they want to understand how best to communicate, but also, you know, in real time, they want to transcribe and uh, be able to react very quickly to um, different circumstances. And they use uh, DeepGram's automatic speech recognition to do it. So um, yeah, the, and we've had entire companies that are built on top of DeepGram as, you know, like a core piece of technology uh, built into them, they wouldn't have been able to exist if DeepGram, you know, wasn't available because uh, because of the accuracy level that we uh, that we supply, um, number of language, languages supported, the scale, like, so we focus on um, 
it returning uh, transcripts very quickly, so generally 10 to 20 times faster than our competition, um, have very fast uh, um, interactive real time. So you might have 500, 1,000 milliseconds um, latency when you're using one of our competitors, but with DeepGram, it'll be like 200 milliseconds. So like, you know, two and a half to five times better. And so the conversation feels more lifelike if you're having a conversation with a bot. Um, uh, so, so yeah, a lot of a lot of different use cases. We're a very horizontal infrastructure type of uh, product uh, where you can use DeepGram to build many different voice products. Mm, interesting. NASA sounds uh, sounds interesting. And the one about the retailer using it in store sounds a little bit a uh, little bit creepy. You yeah, go into a shop, yeah. and you want, you don't really expect yourself to be recorded when you walk into a shop, would you? Well, hey, I mean, you're recording <laughs> on video camera. So you already That's are, true. right? And we're, and we're used true. to that. But, but yeah, it, it is one of those things that we're going to have to uh, decide what to do as a society, what we allow where, and all of that. It's still very new. Um, and yeah, but there are products being developed around uh, all sorts of things right now in voice to try to make people's lives, you know, just a, a little more um, efficient. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well, definitely. And, you know, I can think of, you mentioned like agent assistant stuff like that. We had uh, Mark Bernstein from Bolto on the show a while back and, and their product kind of does that really. There's, a, there's an NLU behind it, obviously the speech recognition um, and so I'm thinking that, you know, the companies, I don't know what they use in terms of their speech recognition, but mm -hmm. things like that, I can see what you're saying in terms of businesses built, being built on top of it. There's another company, um, oh, I forget the name of it now, it might be called something like uh, Punch something, I'll be able to find it anyway. Um, mm -hmm. Basically what they do is they, and, and again, this whether they, whether they use DeepGram, uh, who knows, but they do... Uh, automatic transcriptions of TV shows mm -hmm. and then translate them into other languages in real time. And yep. then also they've got a uh, synthesized voice, basically. I'll tell you the name of the company. because uh, Yeah, that, that will speak it back. Yeah, and it will speak it back. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. It's called, uh, where is it? Uh, Paper Cup. That's it. Paper Cup. Uh, so, yeah. So, basically, what it does, yeah, it will it will take the audio that a, that a video is producing. It will transcribe it all, translate it, and then have speech to text uh, that reads it back, yeah, in real time, which is yeah. phenomenal. So, these, yeah. are the, these are the things that, that can be enabled with something like DeepGram, isn't it? Voice voice community is blowing up right now just with all the possibilities just because, um, I mean, a, a good way to think about uh, how all this works is that there's really kind of three types of things happening in a voice conversation or any type of voice understanding. There's a, uh, there's a first step, which is the perception side. So... This is this is mostly what DeepGram does right now. Although you know, I'll talk about some other things later. But um, the just trying to establish as close as possible the truth to what happened, meaning like what speak what who, which speaker was talking, what words were they saying, when did they say them, and then you know, with what confidence do I does the model have about that? Um, and then uh, the next step after that, so that would be perception. The next step after that would be the understanding part. So say, okay, with all of that information, what do I think they were trying to do? You know, were they trying to order something? Were they just, you know, talking? Were they, uh, you know, did these people just meet for the first time or do they, do they know each other really well? You know, that type of thing. This is the kind of thing that a human can do when they jump in a conversation. Even if you don't know the people that well, you can be like, oh, I think I have a pretty good idea of what's going on and also what they're trying to accomplish. Um, and, a, and a human could then say like, well, I, I should speak back to help them or I should hand them a piece of paper or I should send them a text or I should call somebody or I should do an action. And that third step is that interaction piece. So there's really just that perception, understanding, interaction, and then that loop just happens over and over. Um, and uh, in the inter interaction side, you might have text to speech, like you're talking about generating voice, but it but it could be other simple things: send an email, text, you know, uh, that type of thing. Um, but uh, but yeah, there's there's a rich uh, a rich um, set of products and companies that are being developed around voice right now. And you know, if I had to um, if I had to make an analogy here, it's very similar to like you know, going from steam power to electricity and uh, it's 1900 still. And yes, electricity is around, but it's being only used for like industrial purposes to like, 
you know, raise ore from mines or stuff like that. And then, um, then maybe like the consumer use cases too of like lighting up the streets of Paris to, re to reduce crime or something, but there isn't much in between. Um, and then as time goes on, you know, 1910, 20s, 30s, 40s, et cetera, refrigeration comes around, uh, computing comes around in the 60s, 70s, 80s, et cetera. And then, you know, internet communications, all this stuff builds off from it, basically. Um, and it's it, we're in a very similar state to like 1900 electricity for AI and voice right now, where previously we only had connectivity. That's it. It was just the ability to speak over distance, which is great. Um, but there's no way to inter have a machine interact and do something about it, to automate it, to whatever it is. And we're just at the beginnings of that stage. And um, it's going to turn on. It'll be here forever. Um, and, you know, it'll increase the productivity of the world. And we're going to have to decide what to do with it. Um, but, yeah, it, it's a really exciting time. Interesting. So do you do you see uh, this kind of technology then as to use the to continue the electricity kind of analogy? The electricity is almost like the pipes, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's a little bit like, you know, uh, I suppose not. I would, don't want to use the, the analogy of water pipes because electricity is a lot more flexible than water as such. Because, as you said, electricity enables refrigeration, it enables mm -hmm. connectivity, it enables yep. uh, phone communications now, you know, it enables absolutely everything. Um, and so, do you think that are, are you saying that the this technology, speech recognition technology, and other technologies, NLU, something like that, yep. is pipe work, or is this the stuff that's being built on top? of the pipe work like a version of the refrigerator for argument's sake it, are we laying the pipes yeah. now or are we building on right. top of infrastructure that right we're now we're building the infrastructure right now we're we're laying the railroad track we're putting down yeah we're 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 stringing you know telegraph wires across you know we're we're doing that kind of thing right now um and you know we'll look back at it 10 years from now and say oh wasn't isn't that cute isn't that quaint you know that's what we were working on then you know um but they're necessary steps to show value to the world so that more so that more investment goes into it. Um, they're necessary steps to um, understand what works and what doesn't. Um, I, I, I like I like another analogy here that around the same time is when electricity was really starting to be discovered is uh, this is more of a, a physics analogy, but um, uh, radioactivity was discovered around the same time um, or like starting to be understood more around the same time. Um, and uh, at first people thought of it as magic, you know, just like they thought of electricity too. Um, and there are certain instances where it actually has a, like a really great uh, effect on the world. And then there are certain circumstances where it's like crazy. It, it doesn't make any sense. Um, so for instance, um, people, uh, a, a cancer treatment, um, it, like you need radioactivity in order to have uh, many successful cancer treatments. Um, but uh, what people used to do 100 years ago is like drink a solution of radio radioactive you know atoms, uh, uranium, you know stuff like that, uh, uh, lead, whatever, um, and they got very sick, and you know it, that actually like caused cancer and things like that, right? And so it's like, yes, they're going to help, but but they're going to help in specific ways, and you have to understand the ways that they're actually going to help. Um, it, it can't just be a blanket statement like AI is going to solve everything. No, 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 AI is not going to solve everything. AI is going to help with automation. It's going to help the. It, it, I, I like to I like to think of it like uh, uh, you know we had our, our agricultural revolution we have our industrial revolution right now we're in the middle of an intelligence revolution is the intelligence revolution going to solve everything no it doesn't solve like the space problem of and uh, of where people live it doesn't solve the safety problem for humans and things like that it can help with them but it's not like the thing that's going to solve it all um, but uh, but yeah it, it is a new it is a new modality. It's a new, it's a new thing that didn't exist before, which is uh, all intelligence had to derive from humans in the past. Well, that's not true anymore. It can, it can come from machines now. And, and just like uh, it used to be human labor in the past building goods. Um, now we can rely on machines to build goods. The same, a similar kind of thing is going to happen. It will transform our world, but we'll still have problems. You know, AI is not going to solve them all. Just like electricity doesn't solve them all. Just like connectivity doesn't solve them all, etc. But it's going to, you know, increase the productivity of the world is the best way to think about it. You, you know, you you get to start talking about new problems now. Like, uh, hey, global warming is super serious, and before we were we were all worried about how we were uh, going to do the these other sets of things we've solved those sets of things or many of them using ai now let's focus on these like much more core problems but yeah mm -hmm. interesting and 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 
you, so you're laying the foundations and part of laying those foundations we've kind of touched on a little bit earlier on around you know if you're building a speech recognition model you need some degree of data especially if you're going to cut out that kind of uh, process that we that we spoke about and also if you're going to be able to have something that works outside amongst noisy traffic versus something yep. that is you know in a factory or whatever so inevitably and, you, and you've also referenced accuracy assuming that the accuracy levels that speed uh, that deep gram is providing mm -hmm. is is better than other options on the market and so in order to get that level of accuracy in order to get that uh capability to be able to work well in different environments you inevitably need training data mm -hmm. of some description you've also mentioned computing power which leads me to believe that you need a lot of training data <laughs> yeah. where 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 does a company like deepgram get training data from like is that that must be a surely a large part of what you do is sourcing training data or, or is all that stuff being done now and, it, and the models are just working like how, how do you approach the whole concept of getting training data and, and training I'll, these models i'll tell you definitely any company in the world working on speech uh would not answer the question like it's already been done like no way i i i look at it more like there's a map and that map is super dark everywhere. And you've got a few bright points on it that you know fairly well about. Like um, you can use TV shows or you can use audiobooks, or you can use um, news broadcasts and things like that that are, that are uh, recorded and transcribed. You can use those to uh, help train these, um, these models. But does that cover a, a phone call use case, an internal a uh, company meeting where you're using a whole bunch of jargon, et, et cetera, uh, a noisy in-car situation? Like, no, not at all. There's, and not only that, it's just in all of those situations, you have different people, you know? All, all of our voices sound differently. We speak with different pace and, um, and emphasis. Um, we, we might have, uh, well, everybody has an accent. So just depending on, you know, does the model know that accent really well or not? Um, it, now what language are they speaking? Um, what context are they speaking about? What topic, et cetera? There's like so many different, uh, combinations here and, uh, the, no, no speech researcher would say like, oh yeah, we've got all the data we need. We're all good. Um, uh, you, you need more. Um, but uh, there is also a push in um, AI, which is a very smart one, um, to try to require less data in order to achieve the same goal or a better goal. Um, and this is it, it just an idea of data efficiency, training data efficiency. Um, and the way you do that is by coming up with better techniques. Um, but you know, with that said, Usually the way that you discover something first is by brute force um, and then you back away from it and try and make it more efficient. Um, this is similar to how many things are accomplished in the world. I mean, the first processors, uh, computer processors were massive, you know, they were huge. You could see the transistors on them and now, and then you refine them and make them smaller. But those first processors were, you know, they were a zero to one, you know, step function change. Uh, the world was one way before and then afterward, you know, it was a different way. And then now it's just evolution of that afterward. Similar kind of uh, thing here where you, you, you figure out that something works. And even if it took a lot of energy, a lot of compute, a lot of data, et cetera, you can reduce all those things or you, you're expecting that you'll be able to reduce all those things by possibly orders of magnitude. Um, and, and again, the reason for that reason, or like the reasoning for that is like, hey, humans can do it, cats can do it, mice can do it, et cetera. We probably can do it too. We just have to come up with the right way uh, to, to formulate the problem. Mm. Interesting. So you, if, so, there's an ongoing effort to continually optimize the models based on all of these things you spoke about, mm -hmm. accents, environment, you know, mm -hmm. uh, different types of topics and, and all this kind of stuff. If a, a person listening or, or a potential client or customer or user wanted to use DeepGram, uh, let's say that you mentioned call center, let's say it's a call center mm -hmm. situation, mm -hmm. or maybe it's an internal meeting transcription yep. based yep. thing. Um, are they likely to be able to just use the API because it's already been trained on those environments? Or how often do you need to get involved with a customer to then help them train these models for their unique scenario? 
Yeah. So um, I, 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 I like I like to put it in these terms that uh, there's actually two types of models in the world, these speech recognition models. Um, those that are only trained on for for a general audience, basically, or if they're they're the jack of all trades. It's a single model that tries to do everything, and uh, generally, you call those general models. That, that that's it. Um, but uh, they are not in in most circumstances. They are not the best model for any particular thing. And so, when a company comes to us specifically. Uh, we'll say, um, hey, try it out on the on the general model. Build your demo on the general model. Get things working that way, and it will work very well. You'll be happy. It'll it'll be it'll be fast. It'll be accurate. It'll be um, uh, you know you'll have uh, you'll have a great experience using the API and and testing it all. Um, and it's not going to cost too much. Um, and but once you build your demo, once you get water through the pipes, you're gonna have you're gonna start having questions like. Hey, wait a minute. Um, it missed this particular like word or acronym or something that we use very typically in our business or in 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 our vertical that we operate in. Um, is there some way that you can make the model know that? You know, and um, the answer to that is yes. Uh, for DeepGram, for most other companies, the answer is no. Sorry, what you see is what you get. Um, and the the way that we do that is with a um, a what we what we call model ad adaptation, where um, essentially the model is able to be exposed to your data so it can learn the different acronyms, words, acoustic environments, um, types of people that are using uh, the service. And um, this this may sound like a super involved process. Um, I would say it's not a super involved process now. It was it's it's very tech it's very difficult to build this type of process. But uh, you can have a model that is adapted to you within two weeks and you see like a 30% reduction in errors uh, right within those first couple of weeks. And that's just with using the DeepGram service as if you normally were. And so essentially just over time, your accuracy continues to get better uh, just because it's, it's a new type of model. So I, I kind of tongue in cheek say like our general models are the worst version of our models um, for any particular customer. Uh, because uh, it's probably better for you to train something um, for your particular uh, domain. And that domain doesn't have to be super specific. Most of these companies, it will be like just a meeting a meeting company. Okay, that's still good to, to train it for your domain because it can forget about um, phone calls, podcasts, you know, news broadcasts, all that stuff. It can weight that stuff differently, you know, and it can focus only on uh, getting this other stuff um, uh, done properly. And... Uh, so so anyway, yeah, there there is a there is a way uh, for all of that to work, and um, but it's not normal uh, to have this ability to just turn something on and have the model learn over time. Uh, that's something that we do uh, uniquely at DeepGram. Mm. So so most people will find better results if they do some level of of yeah. tuning, retraining, you know, changing that model. What is a acceptable level of accuracy for for a given use case let's say that um you know let's talk it's word error rate isn't it i suppose is how it's known like yeah. so let's say that your your um maybe it's two different scenarios one might be a meeting scenario transcribing mm -hmm. meeting notes you know which which companies do zoom will do it auto can do that and yep. you'll notice that there's little errors here and there that you need yep. to correct or whatever um versus something that is short sharp crisp like a like a voice assistant call yep. center or, or something yeah. like a, a voice assistant device what's an acceptable kind of word error rate for those sort of environments and and where is it that you as deepgram are, mm -hmm. aiming, are aiming to get to yeah just just to give you a general range um for audio that a human can understand without too much difficulty, um, meaning it's not like crazy uh, noisy or anything like that, um, then 80 to 95% accurate is like the range that you're working in. Um, and to give you an idea, um, a lot of big names don't hit that, uh, even you know for their general model and their most recent models. Um, so uh, there, there's a there's a couple out there like uh, AWS and Google, like their general models uh, will sit in that range. Um, but you know some of the legacy providers like uh, IBM and uh, uh, and Nuance, depending on the the 
the vertical that you're in, it, it might be as low as like 60% or something like that. And so um, there is there is really, there's like a, there's kind of a new, uh, or a, 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 there's a set that are at the top all bunched together. That's like DeepGram, AWS, Google, from a general model perspective, um, that do well on a large, uh, a large variation of many accents and things like that in, in audio, um, in in different modalities or different um, media. So phone calls, you know, podcasts, all that stuff. Um, and then there's kind of all the rest where uh, they you know, they're 60, 70%, 75, that type of thing. And so there's like two kind of groupings. Um, and, uh, but, but, but like I, like I mentioned, um, that's, that's just the beginning for us. Well, you start in that, in that range and it kind of depends, like I, I say 80 to 95% is probably more tip. The typical experience is more like 85 to 92% sort of in that range. And, um, it depends on the audio quality. It depends on how well people are dictating. Um, it, it, it depends on many different things, but um, the t typically the low end of that spectrum would be uh, low signal to noise ratio type scenario. So like in the car, phone call, that type of thing is going to have somewhat lower accuracy. Um, but if it's like a well-recorded podcast, then 92, that, that's probably low, actually. It'll probably be 95, you know, something like that. So um, yeah, it, it's, it's kind of all over the place. It depends on the use case and it depends on the quality of audio and it, dep and it depends on the dictation that's happening. Um, but uh, yeah, that, hopefully that gives you some mm. idea of the range. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. And what's up? So following that kind of journey of a customer who needs some speech recognition capabilities, who has maybe started with uh, using the general model, maybe they've reached some areas where they want to start optimizing it, they've kind of optimized that. That all sounds like a, a, a nice, smooth path to get up and running. Mm -hmm. Presumably, some companies don't have a totally straightforward time with this kind of technology. There's not that many people who uh, have skills in this area, uh, yeah. broadly speaking, you know, mm -hmm. you go into most of the, you know, either banks or insurance companies, retailers, uh, these, these startups who we're talking about who are utilizing this technology. Um, presumably they don't have a tremendous amount of experience in this kind of area. So what are some of the common challenges, common obstacles, if you like, that companies face when trying to get up and running with speech recognition that could be for transcriptions in the call center it could be for yeah. using it on a voice assistant whatever the use case are there some common themes that you notice with customers where there are challenges and how do they overcome them one of the biggest things is access to the data at the time that you need it you know with the with the reliability that you need it and so what i mean is um for instance like call center use case um you have live conversations that are happening right um but uh, a call center like that, that connectivity software or hardware that was built uh, for them dates back to, you know, a lot of them like 90s, 80s, et cetera. It's literally like a server in their basement and all the phone lines are hooked up to it and that type of thing. Uh, it, yes, the customer can talk to the agent and everything happens. Um, but if you want to record it or if you want to uh, send that audio off, for uh, for analysis with some uh, some automation, um, you you have to get access to it, and if you want it to happen in real time, you have to get access to it in real time. Uh, that type of thing, and so I, I bring this up as like the number one thing, just because it's a non-starter if you don't have access to your data. So you have to start talking to your IT people, talk to your engineers, et cetera. Where does our data sit? Um, if it's in an S3 bucket, like an AWS S3 bucket or something like that, that's great. That that that's a nice pre-recorded use case that and where everything's easy. Um, but if it's like hidden away uh, in a call recording software that you bought like 20 years ago, then you're gonna have to figure out how to get it out and set up scripts to start syncing that to a service that's more amenable to automation and. Uh, the reason I put it that way is, you know, five, 10, 20 years ago, there was no automation. Um, all you had to do was store it and then a human would go, you know, rifle through some files, listen to it if they needed to. And they would do that on a tiny percentage of audio and that was it. Um, but uh, the world is changing now to have it have the automation uh, step in here and help assist in many of these QA tasks and compliance tasks and uh, things like that. And so you have to have access to your data. Now, that's if you're starting out with like, you already have an established product or you, you know, you're already collecting a whole bunch of data, that type of thing. If you're, if you're uh, a new company or building a new product, building it from scratch, building it on mobile, that type of thing, you don't have a data access problem. That, that, one's, that one's easy. Uh, capture it from the microphone or, or do whatever you need to do. 
in that case, it's just product development. You have to get a demo working, get it into the hands of your customers and iterate to get to a point where like they actually care and they actually want to use it. Um, because once you get to that point, now many of the whatever problems or tasks or things that you're trying to accomplish, like those things can be solved. Um, like it, just to tell people bluntly, like the, the power is here, you know, now to solve those problems. Um, there is not a one size fits all um, single company that you can go to uh, it, it, with a single product that solves all of everybody's problems. That doesn't exist. Um, but there are pieces, there are Lego blocks that you can put together to solve the problems that you're trying to, to solve. Um, accuracy is key, reliability is key, speed is key, et cetera, in most of these use cases. Um, and then uh, you, you'll probably have like your own data science team or some of your engineers set up a, uh, an understanding piece and an interaction piece. So you come to a company like DeepGram and get your perception down, you know, turn things into words, get that moving s smoothly. Um, and then you set up a, um, not straw man, but just a first demo that, that solves some, some small problem for customers or, or a simple but big problem for customers and then gain momentum that way. And then once you sort of get water through the pipes there, then uh, the success of that pulls you into building more and more and more success. So um, yeah, that, that's just some words of advice that like water through the pipes matters and like make sure you have data access if you're actually working with legacy technology. Hmm. Which, which plenty of companies will be uh, likely, yeah. you know, especially when you're looking at call center use cases and stuff like that yeah. without doubt. Um, so how do organizations, I mean, the, the easy answer to this I already know, uh, which is give DeepGram a call. Uh, yeah. But, but how would an organization go about trying to understand uh, how to choose a speech recognition provider? You've kind of given a lot of good arguments around mm -hmm. why and how DeepGram works and, and the mm -hmm. flexibility and the speed and the accuracy and all of that kind of stuff. Um, but how, how, how do you judge one yeah. provider over another? Because a lot of companies will want to go out into the market and have a look. What advice can you give for people who are, who are, trying to decide what speech recognition system to use, what criteria do you think they should be using to assess which uh, provider is a good provider? Yeah, and, and I'll, I'll back up a little bit from that uh, too and just say like, do you need voice? Do you need voice automation? Do you need understanding? Do you need that? Is, is that something that your company like believes is a differentiator, you know, or is it just kind of a nice to have? And the reason I asked that right now or, you know, up front is, uh, if it's just a nice to have, voice is too hard for you to uh, voice is too hard for you to uh, accomplish. Like you're going to lose motivation basically. If it's just nice to have, you know, <laughs> like mm -hmm. it, it's too hard. Um, you know, wait a year, two years, like whatever it is, until some more like turnkey services come out and and you can you know try a few things. But if but if you recognize like, hey, um, our competitors like we're worried about our competitors doing voice where we really do think that this is, um, you know, we see the next stage of automation and uh, we're afraid, you know, we're going to lose out or like we just want to be the ones to bring the best service to our customers. And so we're willing to invest and go after it. Um, I think that matters. That conviction is what means you'll be successful essentially. So like establish that conviction first because like I said, the tools are available. You can do it. Um, uh, the, but are you going to put the resources behind it, the motivation behind it, et cetera, and then go out there and actually you know, build that successful product or uh, build that successful new line of business? Okay. But once you've decided that, you know, now, you, now you look for, uh, hey, uh, there's, there's some big um, uh, uh, cloud providers. So like I mentioned, AWS, Google, uh, that type of thing. And, and I'm okay mentioning uh, competitors. We all have different uh, differentiators. Um, and uh, like Google Google and AWS, um, they they don't, uh, you know, they're in the cloud. They don't run on-prem. One thing I didn't mention is that DeepRam runs on-prem. Um, it, it, it doesn't have to, you know, we, we host it if you'd like. You could run it in your own AWS VPC or you could, you know, run it on your own hardware if you'd like. Uh, that's a really big deal for you know uh, companies that have you know large call centers and that type of thing. But you have to really start thinking about those constraints. Where does my data live? Do I need it to run on prem or in the cloud? Okay, it, if if in the cloud is okay and you're okay with giving away your data to a whole bunch of people, then a lot of options open up. 
if you're not okay with giving uh, giving away the data or you just need a more controlled like partner on that side then you have to you can start, you can weed out a lot of different things and you'll start to have only like two or three conversations with vendors then um but uh, but really, I, I, I think that strategic side of, hey, is voice strategic to us? Are we willing to invest in it? Um, then, you know, go go meet with the uh, go meet with the companies um, and see how they treat you as a customer, because that strategic side uh, to, to what you're building is what matters to you the most. And um, many of these providers, uh, it's it's really just like a sign up there's no there's no customer success that's helping you along there's there, there's no you know good luck trying to uh get somebody on the phone at some of the biggest providers uh they're not going to customize a model for you um sorry if it's slow that's just what you have to deal with um that's just how it is you're not going to get a better price you know that type of thing but like i said there are really good reasons to go with them like if you were uh if you're just setting up a demo a, a lot of times it's really easy to get that going um through uh the big providers um or if you have a uh, like like Google's really great at addresses, you know, that type of thing. If you need addresses, maybe you use Google for the address part, you know, but, uh, but really it's, uh, if it's strategic enough, then you should be thinking about that deeper relationship and how is that company going to scale? Are they going to cover the languages that you care about? And then what's next after ASR? So like, you know, we're just talking about ASR here, but like what's next that, that piece that I was talking about, which is, you know, what is a human going to be able to do, um, in a conversation or, what would a human do in this circumstance? You know, um, is the company building that type of thing as well on top of the ASR or as the as the next piece in the understanding stack? And um, and again, if it's strategic to you, uh, then you'll probably care about that a lot. Like automatic language detection, being able to tell if they're different speakers or not, being able to tell what topic they're talking about, that type of thing. So. Um, yeah, uh, and I would say don't lose sight of the cost. Uh, aside because um, it's easy to look at just licensing and not compute cost or something like that. You want to you want to look at real total cost of ownership because speech in many cases is really expensive. Again, this is one of our differentiators because we we use um, uh, we use hardware acceleration and end to end deep learning. And so generally um, uh, for the same workload are, are generally much cheaper than our competition. But like think about that. Um, and yeah, so it, it's it's a. Uh, I wouldn't say it's an easy, I, I don't envy the person who has to go out and look at all the different vendors and, and look at the different things. It's really tough. Uh, but, you know, uh, at, at DeepGram, we're scientists. We like to help people find the best solution for what they're doing. So, you know, you can contact us. We'll help you do an ASR comparison if you want, you know, send it through DeepGram's general models, send it through our competitors' general models, you know, do do a comparison for you and say, hey, here's what it looks like. Um, here's what the costs would be, et cetera. And you know you can do your own analysis on that as well. Um, so yeah, uh, it, it's it's not it's not easy to go out there and do it. But again, if it's strategic enough, then it's going to be worth it for you to go down that path. Mm, perfect. That was absolutely spot on. Matt. And where would where could people, if they are interested in doing one of those comparisons, what's the best way for them to go about doing that? Yeah. So deepgram.com. Um, you can you can contact us uh, there. Um, email me at scott at deepgram.com uh, or you know just send me a connection on LinkedIn. Uh, that type of thing. Happy to get involved and help you. Uh, our, our our partners. I mean, we really we treat them as partners at Deepgram, and I think that is part of the one of the differences um, for how how our business model works is that uh, our our processing our processing differentiation um, means that our margins are a lot higher than our competition and therefore we can spend more on the customer service side, you know, customer success side and the partnership side. And so I think you'll, you would see that um, if you contact us and, you know, just start that conversation. Um, and like I said, I, I mentioned them, I'm mentioning them now in this too, like if we think a competitor is going to be a better fit for you, we'll, we'll, we'll send you over there too. Like it, it's uh I, I, we're we're not afraid um, in this world. There's a, there's certainly like a rising tides lifts all boats um, uh, si situation in voice and and uh, automation right now. Uh, if, if we all play nice together and solve the things that we are good at, you know, it's only going to help our customers and then um, and then bring even more adoption to the world. So, mm. uh, yeah, happy to have that conversation if people want to have it. Wicked. Fantastic. I'm mindful of time, Scott. I know we've run over a little bit, but I really appreciate you joining us. Absolutely fascinating. I think you're right that, you know, 
that white glove service, I think, is going to be a real help for people who ha are not experienced in this area, don't really know what to look for and, and how to get moving with it and stuff like that. Inevitably, the big cloud providers are a kind of like, you know, pile it high and, and ship it kind of approach. Yeah. Whereas to get this stuff right, I mean, you mm -hmm. mentioned at the beginning, you've got a music background. And for anyone who's familiar with any musical production, mm -hmm. you need to get a clean signal at the beginning. Because if you get crap in, then you get crap out at the other end. And the speech recognition part of it, I've said many times before on, on many, many shows in the past, that the speech recognition part of it, especially when it comes to voice assistance, as we talk about mostly on this show, the speech recognition part of it is absolutely crucial because if you get crap in, you get crap out and the whole thing breaks down. And so I love Very the approach. Oh, yeah. Thank you. I yeah. love I love the approach uh, and I, I, I love what you're doing. And I definitely vouch for, for Deep Ground when people are uh, trying to do something uh, that requires it. So thank you very much, Scott. I'll stick the links in the show notes, as always. Uh, if you are not subscribed to the show, uh, the newsletter, by now, then where have you been all, where have you been all my life? Uh, VUX.world forward slash subscribe. Every week we have conversations like this with experts in the field like Scott uh, and many, many more, sometimes twice a week as it is this week and the next few weeks. Uh, so if you are interested in the bleeding edge of conversational technologies, then do subscribe there. Without further ado, and uh, it's not really without further ado because it seems a bit harsh to say that. I don't really want to end this conversation. I think we left a lot on the table there, uh, yeah. and, and hopefully we can do this again sometime soon. Um, but it's been an absolute pleasure, Scott. Really appreciate it. Thanks very much. Thank you. Cheers.